yeah welcome to the uh, class uh, welcome to this voice uh, lectures and this is the second class okay and uh, so yeah first of all uh, you have any uh, questions or any queries because in the last class just we uh, the introduced uh, the basics we are in the basics still but uh, uh, something like very briefly uh, we discussed about the uh, different components of a computer at a very gross level uh, and then how they interact um, uh, basically how the IO devices will interact with the computer and all using uh, the interrupts uh, so those things we discussed very briefly and uh, today we'll continue from that um, and uh, we'll try to cover this introduction maybe today today's uh, two lectures as well maybe the uh, even the next week also we'll continue that so with that we'll complete the uh, the introductory stuff related to this operating systems and then we move on to the the specific topics uh, related to the process management ma memory management and so on so that was the the plan and um, so today we'll continue the the lecture that, uh, like the the one which you stopped earlier and all OK, and uh, another thing is that uh, today uh, at 11.45, uh, uh, I have scheduled uh, the mock quiz. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as I mentioned that this quiz is uh, just to know about uh, uh, get uh, get to know about how the uh, the, the test uh, looks like. And uh, you also get uh, familiarized with the uh, giving the uh, the test in the in the online manner and all so might be you have done already you have experienced in the last semester as well uh, but uh, and another thing is that uh, since the class strength is not stabilized uh, and that too had taken the very first class so that is another reason for keeping this test as a mock test and all so that way this test is not considered for grading grade in purpose but still i uh, request recommend you that please take the test don't miss it uh, you will get a feel for that and uh, in the test whatever the the mistakes you do so that you can able to take care in the uh, in the next uh, test at all so that is one of the reasons for that so please uh, all of you please take the test while take while uh, taking the test don't leave the meeting and all so you please take the test uh, or through the teams only in the meeting by attending the meeting and all so that so whatever the announcements will made so that you can able to uh, listen to the, those announcements and all like like the the last uh, the due time uh, when you are supposed to submit so those things and all so that therefore while uh, taking the test be in the meeting don't leave from the uh, this general channel and all and already the test was posted but anyway it will open you can able to open it you can able to answer that only from 11 45 so i have given a 15 minutes time and all but uh, as such uh, this test will not take much time maybe 10 minutes maximum okay so that's all about the the mock test and all so uh, let us uh, move on to the the class lecture and as i mentioned that since it's a two hours class we'll take a break in between for five minutes so let me uh, stop the lecture at some at a, a logical uh, end point hmm, so that we can start the next one later on we'll take a break of five minutes okay so uh, so let me start hmm, if you don't have queries so let me go to the presentation slides uh, excuse me sir. yeah yeah please uh, sir in one of the previous slides you mentioned that uh, like it is mentioned that the one program running at all times in the computer is the kernel. So yes. what exactly do we mean by a kernel? No, no, it's not the running means actually mean to say is that most of the times it used to uh, like executed by the CPU and all. That's what I mean. The kernel is nothing but the the programs, all the uh, the programs where that used to manage the this uh, the resources like IO devices and hardware whatever so all of them so it used to have like uh, like managing or providing interface provide and uh, um, like uh, connecting that 
for the given program, given process and all. For that purpose, like as and when uh, today in the class uh, today, uh, we'll take an example and then you can able to see that uh, for running a program, one simple program, just for copying a file, for example, you can come across that actually how many times uh, uh, that uh, operating system need to be called or you can say that the kernel routines used to be called very frequently and all just for simple command like a copying a file from one file to other file so you can able to see that actually how many system calls system calls are nothing but uh, operating system uh, codes operating system programs and all so how many times that used to be called so with that you can get some idea about so when you're running a program normal user program or any application program and all so uh, like at what frequency or at how frequently the operating system will be utilized for running the application program. So in that context, I mentioned that all the time and all it's not that all the time means uh, it's not the entire time and all. It's like most frequently you, you can come across the operating system routines. That's what I mean by that. Hmm? Okay. okay. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Next we move on to these things uh, like yeah, in the last class we discussed about these things. I'm not going to the details of that again. Yeah, this we had discussed like uh, how these uh, various peripherals will interact with the CPU and all. Like uh, whenever whatever the task that was given to this peripheral when it is completed, how they interact with the CPU. So it way by using the interrupt. That's what we have mentioned. Like um, like because CPU is executing some program and uh, the IO is uh, the IO devices, some uh, data transmission uh, data transfer will takes place uh, from IO device to the device controller and so on. That way it's happening may may happen parallelly simultaneously. So in that case, uh, when the like for example the, whatever the IO device task that is completed at that time it has to in, inform to the CPU. So in that case it makes use of the interrupt and all. Uh, so then uh, how it uh, then after that how the CPU will react to that. Mm? So these things we have discussed about that because and another thing is that there are several IO devices will be there. So in that case how the CPU will know that actually which IO device has interrupted and all. So for that purpose we have uh, different ways to do that. One way is that uh, using interrupt vector. Uh, so so whenever the device is interrupted, then the CPU will send uh, after that it will send an acknowledgement and then upon receiving the acknowledgement, the device will put the interrupt vector number. That means that particular uh, device number or whatever. So then the CPU will see that and uh, that is the nothing but the interrupt vector and all like so for example, you have some hundred devices are there. So the device will be numbered like in unique way like one, two, three and so on. So suppose device 53 has interrupted, has sent an interrupt and all. So then the CPU when it, after that it sends acknowledgement, interrupt acknowledgement through a bus and upon receiving the acknowledgement against to that immediately the that particular device which has interrupted, it will just put its number like device number and all. So that is nothing but your interrupt vector. And with that, the CPU will realize that the device 53 has interrupted and it has to provide the service to that. So that way the interrupt vector is again indexed to the a table in the kernel like uh, where there are as I mentioned suppose there are 100 devices are there each device has its own way to be serviced. So therefore for uh, for servicing the each device there is a separate uh, kernel routine or like IO routine IO service routine will be there. So all these things will be uh, put it in a tabular format table and uh, this table was indexed by this interrupt number. So that way, so whichever the device has interrupted, then the the then by using interrupt vector, the CPU will come to know that uh, which service routine has to be, which interrupt service routine or which interrupt handler has to be uh, serviced. So that way it will come to know that and the corresponding service routine will be executed. And with that, whatever the, the device data, whatever it is captured and also it will be transferred to CPU or from that CPU, will be transferred to memory or whatever so that can be done. So and again these details uh, whatever I'm saying the interrupt handling and uh, all these details and all uh, it will be dealt more clearly in the your uh, architecture part later on actually. And uh, that way uh, the devices we have seen the hardware devices how they 
uh, interrupt the CPU and all to carry out their uh, service whenever they have fulfilled the task and all. And the same way there is uh, uh, even the uh, the CPU will be uh, like the 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 user programs also will uh, request the the uh, the operating system service. So that will be done by using that known to be trap or exception, or this also known to be software interrupt. So the interrupts, whatever we just mentioned, like uh, the devices, I/O devices, and other things, and those are known to be hardware interrupts. It means that basically the hardware will uh, uh, interrupt the CPU to perform its to carry out its service, right? So then the same way the user programs when they run, so they also need. Uh, yeah, right. Look something. Yeah. So, yeah, can you able to see the slide? Hello? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, because I got some message like a warning, so that's the reason I stopped. Okay, so, so that way, uh, like uh, even the, the user programs also need the, the intervention or need the operating system services in a different context. For example, when the user program is executing, if some error has occurred, as I mentioned, like division by zero or so on, or sometimes when the user program is executing, then the program needs some I.O., for example, that means uh, suppose it needs some input from a keyboard or it needs some file to be uh, like a read and uh, something to be written into the file. So these are the various uh, IO activities where the user program requires and all. So for doing all these things and also it requires the IO uh, service is required and all. So, uh, so not IO service, uh, like interrupt uh, the, uh, the OS service is required. The OS has to take care of that. So in that case also, the uh, that means the, the, the current execution of the program will be stopped and the corresponding OS uh, service will be done, carried out. Uh, so that way, these, in this case, the these interrupts are known to be software generated interrupts because the user program, whatever the program that is executing, so that generates the interrupt. So these are sometimes also known to be trap or like exception and all exceptions. Right, and uh, so these are basically the software generated interruption. Or either due to the like uh, some malfunction is happening or some uh, like uh, the error is going to happen while executing this particular program, or the program itself needs some I/O. Right, so in that case also, the current execution will be stopped, and the corresponding uh, uh, like service routine uh, OS service will be taken care. And yeah, as I mentioned that, yeah, this is we discussed. For example, if interrupt occurs, then how does the CPU will know that actually which service routine need to be executed and all. So there are different ways. One is the using interrupt vector where uh, the device will put its device number so that acts like interrupt vector. So with that, uh, the corresponding interrupt service routine will be executed. And another uh, way is that it kind of a polling, as I mentioned that uh, here, so whatever the devices were there, each device will contribute a single bit in the bit sequence, like in kind of a bitmap kind of a thing. So if none of the devices is uh, interrupting, so in that case, all bits will be zero. And suppose if any device is uh, interrupting, uh, send an interrupt signal and all, for that particular interrupt, uh, bit will be set to one. So that way, the CPU, the other way of uh, uh, knowing the uh, the, the device which is interrupted, the CPU can just, it will just scan that bitmap, the sequence of bits and all. So whichever the bit position is one, it indicates that a particular device or the particular uh, device is interrupted and also with that the corresponding uh, service routine will be taken care. So that is known to be polling. It means that here the CPU after uh, receiving the interrupt, then CPU is scan the the bitmap, it just pull the bits uh, of the sequence of bits. And then whichever the bit is one, that indicates that the particular uh, the device is interrupted and the corresponding service routine will be taken care. It's known to be polling. So there are different ways and all, but uh, just these are the some, uh, some of them were just as a uh, exemplary uh, purpose we have just uh, uh, discussed it here. 
and uh, yeah as i mentioned that uh, after knowing that then the separate segments of code uh, will be determined and what action to be taken against to that particular interrupt so that will be done based on that interrupt service routine yeah the the next thing is here is that actually this particular chart uh, diagram uh, indicates that actually how the cpu and the io devices will execute uh, with respect to the time so here in this the 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 plot at the uh, in the upper portion in the top so here you can able to see that uh, this upper portion has the the two levels uh, one is uh, the, the here the level uh, that means the upper one that is the pulse the positive amplitude uh, you can say the, the higher one which indicates that the user process is executing the user process is executing and then here the pulse, the lower amplitude, or you can say that uh, this negative one, you can say that if you assume that this is the zero reference, this is a negative one. So these pulse, these negative pulses, uh, those things are indicating that the IO interrupt processing. That means when uh, some device is uh, sending a request, uh, the interrupt request and all, then that interrupt service routine execution is indicated by this negative pulse, the duration of this negative pulse. And then once this interrupt service routine is over and again, the CPU will start executing the, the normal user process, like the next process, whatever. And then after some time, suppose when interrupt occurs again, it uh, takes care of the interrupt service routine. So therefore here, the in these two figures, the upper, the top figure, uh, where the, the amplitude is fluctuating between the two levels, and in that the higher level indicates that uh, the CPU is executing the user process, and the lower level indicates that the CPU is executing the, the IO, uh, some interrupt. Uh, interrupting the, uh, executing the interrupt is nothing but uh, the in response to interrupt, the CPU execute the interrupt service routine. So that in execution of interrupt service routine is indicated by, uh, to just to indicate that uh, this particular time, the, the, the lower level. So then after execution of interrupt service routine, then the interrupt is processed, right? Then the CPU is free, then it will execute the, the user process. And then after some time again, there is interrupt occurs, then it uh, immediately takes care of the interrupt service routine. Then after finishing the interrupt service routine, then the CPU is free for execution of the normal uh, user programs. So this timeline uh, between these two levels, just to illustrate that uh, one level is meant for uh, 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 indicating the, the user process uh, execution, and the other level is uh, indicating the um, like the OS routine or interrupt service uh, execution and all. And coming to the the bottom plot where this this also has a two levels, and here these two levels are indicated by one level is indicated by idle. That means I/O device there is no activity is taking place in the I/O device, and uh, the other level indicating that some data transfer is taking place. So in IO device where the data transfer will takes place because we have a device and then for controlling the device, each device we have a device controller will be there. Suppose for example, we have a keyboard. You have keyboard is the mechanical device and then that uh, device is connected to the device controller and where the, the computer will interact with this device controller, right? So uh, so here the in the IO device, the transferring of data, the data communication means from the device to the device controller. So here in this plot, actually here the, the 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 level, the bottom level, indicating that the data transfer that is happening in the I/O device, and uh, the level, the upper level, or you can say that the higher level, indicating that the there is no activity at all. Then the I/O device is idle and all. I/O device is idle. So that way, this particular plot indicate is fluctuating between the the activity of I/O device, and you can able to these vertical lines indicating that some event has occurred. Suppose uh, the I/O request has occurred, for example, the I/O request has made. Then till that point, there is no I/O activity at all. When I/O request is made, then accordingly the the that the the as per the the request, whether it's a read request or the write request, whatever. So the corresponding activity will take place. The corresponding activity will take place between the device and a device controller. And then once that activity is over, then it has to inform to the CPU. Then it has to inform to the CPU so that the CPU will take care of that. CPU will take care of that. Suppose, for example, you have a keyboard controller, for example. 
So the user program requires the uh, like uh, the input from the user and all. So that means there is I/O request was made by the user program, right? Uh, and then then the I/O request is made at this point. Then uh, it means that actually the the OS will uh, place the corresponding status information through the device driver into the device controller. Then the device controller will come to know that there is some data that is uh, about to given uh, the user will supply and you need to capture that data, capture that uh, particular keystroke or the character or whatever. So that way here at this point of time, the IO request is made by the user program and then subsequently uh, the corresponding uh, operating system routine uh, or the device driver and all, it will place the desired control information into the device controller. So with that, the device controller will come to know that there will be some data that is uh, available from the keyboard and you need to capture that. So that is done by using here. That means I will request is made. Then afterwards, whatever the the data transfer between the device to the controller that takes place here. And then once the data transfer is over, that means once the data is captured, then the device control is ready. That means data is now available. So that will be informed to the CPU. How uh, the transfer is done? That will be informed to the CPU how by using interrupt by sending a signal to the uh, CPU through uh, the interrupt pin uh, at the interrupt pin. So that the here the CPU will realize that the interrupt has occurred, right? Here the CPU at this instant the transfer is complete. Then immediately the device controller will send the interrupt. Will send the interrupt. So then that means this is the instant time instant at which the CPU has received the interrupt. So at that time the CPU may be executing uh, a process, uh, one of the instructions of the process. So let the CPU will complete that uh, instruction, and after that, the CPU will, after that, the CPU will take care about that interrupt. That means whatever the interrupt that has arrived, it has to service that interrupt. So that will be carried out here up, uh, after this one. So at this point of a time, the CPU may be in the execution of some instruction of the user program. So then after finishing that instruction, then the CPU will take care about the uh, this particular interrupt. That means the, the corresponding interrupt service routine will be executed. That's what IO interrupt processing. It means that this one. So this negative small pulse. So during that time, the interrupt service routine will be executed. And uh, then the, it means that with that, the OS routine or the device driver will, uh, uh, will uh, capture the input from the device controller. That means the CPU will get the input from a device controller. And then it has to pass on to a memory or whatever. So that will be done here during this interval. And once this interrupt service is over, then again the CPU will take care about the user programs. It will take care about the, the user programs and all. Take care about the user programs. And here again, uh, and here once this uh, transfer is complete, then the IO device will send the uh, interrupt, and afterwards it is free. Afterwards it is free, like it is idle. Then upon again the next IO inter IO request, upon again IO request, then the, the IO device will perform the transfer, the IO transfer here. And then once the transfer is again done, so then again it will inform to the CPU. So when it requests the CPU, then the CPU will complete the current instruction and then it starts uh, execution of the, and then it starts the, the, uh, the, the interrupt service routine will be carried out. So that way, uh, the, by using this uh, time chart, you can able to see that how the IO device and the CPU will uh, coordinate to perform the, the IO activity and all. Uh, and then the coming to this, uh, yeah, when you perform this IO, there are different ways. Earlier, actually, if there is a non-interactive systems and all, and if the time is doesn't, uh, uh, if the multi-programming is not that uh, much required, uh, is not that much essential. So in that case, if IO starts, that means when IO request has come, when IO starts, then when the program needs IO, at that time, uh, uh, that time then the CPU will, uh, then the user program starts waiting for IO. It means that control, are not, then the program will be waiting for IO. And then the control returns to the user program only upon the IO completion. So till that point, the CPU will be keep on waiting for completion of IO. And whenever the IO completes, at that time the CPU will take care and then the user program will be wherever it stops, it starts running from that. 
this is like not in the context of multi programming and all in the case of multi programming where when the io request occurs and then when the io starts that means when the operating system takes care of that and then the the io is initialized to the device controller and all then after that immediately the control returns to the user program and then the uh, the cpu will uh, carry out the the user program some other user program right so that way the uh, like for that actually we will make use of the system call system call is nothing but uh, uh, the that means uh, taking care, help of uh, the os routine because the user the user program requires the the io that is some input or some output whatever so in that case uh, it it is it will be carried out by using the operating system so therefore the system call will be initiated and then uh, the system call will see that uh, which io is required and based on that the corresponding device table like uh, for each device it maintains the like uh, all devices they maintain the kind of a table device status table so in that with respect to that uh, table uh, a particular uh, Uh, user program is request the inter uh, it request the io for a particular device then it will uh, add that to, uh, uh, in that table the corresponding interrupt request will be added to that suppose the device is busy already some requests are pending then it has to be waited wait till that uh, the preceding request has to be uh, carried out so that way you can able to uh, uh, the io will be taken care and the there is another way of uh, data transmission between the the io devices and the memory and this is known to be direct memory access so here uh, if you see that whatever we have seen um, uh, for example if there is some high speed uh, io devices uh, where the data transmission or the you need to have a data transfer instead of uh, small uh, like uh, small amounts of data suppose if you need to have larger amounts of data that need to be transferred for example suppose for example you have a user program where it requests uh, some file uh, some file and where that file is there in the disk for example and the file size is also reasonably uh, uh, larger and you need to bring that file from the disk to the memory so in that case actually if you want to go by the normal way of uh, data transfer it means that the cpu has to take care about like uh, for every byte transfer or for every word transfer the cpu has to intervene that means uh, using that uh, the registers the device control registers and all first uh, it has to fetch to the cpu then the cpu has to place it into the memory so it means it takes lot of time and not only that the cpu will waste a uh, cpu will uh, for every byte transfer for every word transfer the cpu has to intervene so that is fine for small amounts of data uh, like for example one word two words are like a, a few bytes of data it's fine it, it can able to do that but if you have larger amounts of data that need to be transferred and uh, for every uh, for every access for every word access if you want the cpu intervention is required it is very uh, the cpu time will be wasted with this data transfer itself most of the times so therefore there is another way to handle that it's known to be the direct memory access so here the idea here is that if there is if you want to transfer a large blocks of data from for example from a disk to a memory for example in the normal way is that actually from the disk first of all the disk controller will fetch the data from the disk from uh, from uh, whatever the file you are requested so that has to be fetched by the disk controller from the disk right so disk is nothing but it's in a, like you have a hard disk where we have uh, tracks and then the sectors will be there on that sectors the data will be there in the form of a blocks so first of all you have to fetch the data in the disk controller then afterwards from the disk controller the cpu has to read and again the cpu has to place into the memory location specific memory location so it needs lot of time that is uh, takes care of uh, like for every word transfer you need to have minimum some 10 to 15 instructions need to be executed and takes lot of time so to overcome that you have the another uh, way of uh, accessing a data uh, tra data uh, transferring a data between the uh, like high speed io devices and memory it's known to be direct memory access and all so in this case actually from the name itself the cpu will not intervene for every uh, byte transfer of, or for every word transfer and all cpu will not intervene in this transmission for every word transfer and all so for, for example here the idea here is that very uh, gross way 
Suppose uh, CPU requests a file transfer to be done from a disk to a memory in principle. So in that case, once the uh, once the request is made to the device controller of the disk, then the device controller first it will uh, fetch the data, whatever the like uh, 10 kilobytes or 20 kilobytes, whatever. So that data will be fetched and it will be kept in its lo local buffer. So once the data is ready, then the device controller will inform to the CPU, will inform to the CPU. Then the CPU will uh, allow the bus or will, will allow for the data transmission from the, uh, the device controller to the memory directly without intervention of the CPU and all, without the intervention of CPU. So at that time, actually, when the, device, when the data is ready at a device controller, and if it is informed to the CPU, then the CPU can give uh, access to the device controller to the bus. Then the device controller, by making use of the bus, it will directly transfer the data to the memory. That means for that, actually, it's not as simple as that. The CPU has to give the, the address locations from where the data where the data has to be uh, placed in the memory and all. So it has to give us some starting memory allocation, how much of data, how many bytes need to be transferred. So all the data, all the information will be provided to the uh, uh, both the device controller as well as the, the memory controller and all. Then with that actually, then the device controller will perform the data transmission from the device, con from the disk controller to the, the memory and all directly without intervention of CPU. And at that time, here the device may be informed to the CPU once per block, once per block. Here the block may be like, for example, four kilobytes, for example, or maybe the 16 kilobytes. So that means till that block transfer, then the CPU will not be intervened. CPU will not be disturbed, right? Otherwise, in normal circumstances where the CPU will be intervened for every word transfer or for every whatever the size of the bus, if it is a 32 bit or 64 bit, like for every uh, chunk of that uh, uh, word transfer, the CPU will be intervened and uh, uh, like CPU has to uh, like, uh, like has to monitor and all. So here in this case, direct memory access uh, and all where the, the data will be transferred directly between the device controller and the memory directly uh, without intervention of CPU and the device controller will inform like the like a per block basis. So here the block size is much larger, or, uh, much orders of uh, larger magnitude compared to uh, 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 like a fundamental uh, data transfer, like a byte or like a word transfer and all, right? So this is the uh, concept of the direct memory access uh, and all. And uh, now you can able to see this uh, architecture where it supports uh, uh, the facility of direct memory access and the normal way of doing. And here you can see that uh, here in this architecture here, this is the CPU, right? And uh, this is your memory, main memory. And here, these are the devices. Here, this is one of the device, assuming that maybe a disk device or whatever. And uh, here, the CPU is executing a process. And here, it's mentioned as a thread, thread of execution. So don't worry about the terminology thread. Thread is nothing but a sequence of execution, a sequence of execution. So in a process, you may have the multiple sequence of executions which are independent may happen. Like for example, you wrote a code, for example, you, you have your C program where it has some uh, four or five C functions for there. And those C functions are such a way that those functions can be executed uh, independently, can be executed independently without interfering to each other. So in that case, you can say that the program, if we have uh, availability of multiple processes, you can able to run that program on a multiple process, even though it's a single program, single process. Since there are like multiple sequence of executions are there, which are independent. Like that means what I mean to say is that in a program, we have four functions are there and all those functions are independent, assuming that they don't interfere. So in that case, you can start those functions. You can execute those four functions simultaneously. So that that uh, that concept is known to be thread. So in that case, you can say that that particular process is having the four threads, four threads. So that means a sequence of execution, independent execution, is known to be thread and all. So anyway, uh, you will we will discuss about these threads uh, exclusively in one of the chapters and all. Uh, like uh, so, there uh, it will be more clear to you what are the advantage of threads and other things and all. So it's basically a thread of ex uh, it's execution, like it's a process execution. 
and uh, here in the process execution and uh, it may require the IO. So if it requires IO, first it will send the IO request. So the IO request means it will not directly contact the device and all. It will when the IO request means it will just contact the the OS and the OS will intervene and OS will uh, put the request to the device and all. And then uh, the device that uh, whatever the the data is transfer is over, then the device will send the interrupt. The device will send the interrupt back to the CPU, and then the data transmission will takes place. Here you can see the data will be the arrow will be both sides. So here the arrow will be both sides when the when the IO request is made. At that time, whatever the input that has to be given to the device, that will be carried out by using OS, by using the device drivers in the OS. The device drivers, because the OS contains the device drivers, it's a software where the device driver will be specific to each of the device, type like the way the device controller are there. So similar to that, in the OS also, it has a different types of device drivers are there, which used to manage the, which used to, which can be used to talk to the, the corresponding device controller. So when the IO request is made by the process, right, then immediately the OS will take over and the OS in that OS means the particular, the particular device driver will, will send that control information, whatever is required to the particular device controller. So that way I can say that here the data, this towards the uh, arrow towards this device is indicating that the OS will send the data to the device controller, right? And then upon that, then the device controller based on the whatever uh, the state, the information that is there. And with that, actually, either it can treat the data, it can take the input from the data from the keyboard or whatever the device and all. Then once that input is ready, the available at the device controller, then it will inform to the CPU using the interrupt. Inform to the CPU using the interrupt. And upon informing to the CPU, then the CPU will again run the, the OS, uh, the OS routine or the corresponding interrupt service routine. So when it runs the interrupt service routine at that time, whatever the data that was there in the device controller, that will be read by the CPU. So that way you can say that the data will be it will be back and forth, right? And uh, the same way, yeah, this is for the normal way of I/O transfer, right? Hello. The interrupt interrupt driven I/O transfer, right? Hello. Uh, yeah. Hello. Yes, sir. Sir, I had a doubt that when the device is basically sending data to the CPU for execution, sir, does the operating system like switch to the kernel mode at that time? Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Whenever the operating system is running, yes, right, it is in a kernel mode. Okay. Yeah. Whenever the whatever the operating system instruction, or operating system code, or operating system function is running, it's in the kernel mode. Okay. So this is a normal I/O transfer, right? And then just now I just mentioned that there is another way of I/O transfer between the devices to the memory. So that is known to be DMA. So uh, when when if the, if you want to transfer a large chunks of data between the device to the memory. For example, as I mentioned, like you need to transfer a file from a, a disk to hard disk to the memory. So in that case, the based on the file size, it has a large amount of data need to be transferred. So in that case, it's better to use the DMA. You can use the DMA. That means direct memory access. So with the direct memory access, you can able to transfer from either side, from the memory, to, from a disk to the memory or memory to the disk. If you want to write something, into the uh, disk, for example, uh, you want to remove the file, for example, or otherwise uh, uh, this file, uh, you want to write something here and all in the in the in that file. So after writing that, this again, uh, the content has to be placed into the device also. So that way, the DMA can be done in the both the ways. You can read and write. So this is the di direct memory access, right? And then here there's a cache. This we'll uh, discuss a bit later. The cache is, is nothing but a small amount of uh, buffer or memory, uh, which is very fast, uh, where that is the reason that it is attached to the CPU or like a part of the CPU also, where the CPU can able to access these uh, memory locations very fast compared to accessing the, the main memory. It's uh, like order of differences will be there. Suppose for accessing the, the main memory, if it takes about 100 nanoseconds, and for raxing the contents of the cache, it takes about order of uh, like a uh, nanosecond or like a two, three nanoseconds. So that is the difference between the access time of a cache versus access time of the main memory and all. So that way, uh, nowadays, most of the processors, they have some cache memory and where uh, the instructions that are uh, to be executed in a very short while or uh, in the future in a very uh, so those instructions will be placed in the cache 
and then uh, the CPU, whatever the instructions are required, first it will check with the cache, and if it is not there, then only it will go for the main memory. Uh, it will uh, check for the main memory, access the main memory and all. So that way here, and again, as you know, that CPU will interact with the memory. Uh, so therefore, that there will be data movement between the memory and the CPU, so both the directions and all. Because CPU will take uh, data from the memory, like uh, it will fetch the instructions and the data also. And then at the same time, it will also write into the memory also results or whatever and all. So that way, this is the 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 basic architecture of uh, the way with respect to the data flow. Then coming to the uh, the storage structure. So far, we just discussed about the like the communication uh, inside the computer between the I/O peripherals to the CPU and uh, those the aspects. Now we'll just discuss about the different. Uh, um, the storage structure are like you say that uh, different uh, ways how the the data or the programs and where they are stored and all. So you have the in the storage structure there are different uh, uh, types of storage in a at a different levels. Uh, we have seen already here in the previous uh, diagram where we have already seen the the storage uh, in a, at two levels. So one is at a main memory like you can say that uh, this is the memory where the CPU can have access. And then along with that, there is another memory known to be cache memory, which is the size is small and the speed is the access time is very fast here and the cost wise also it is expensive. So here you can able to see that there are two types of memory. One is a cache memory and another one is the main memory and all. So here these two are differ uh, or the characteristics are different with respect to the speed and the size and so on. So likewise, you have the for uh, storing the data and all, we have the, the, the storage, uh, the memory will be there at a multiple levels and all. So we'll see that. And the main memory is the one where the largest, uh, the largest storage media, the, where the CPU can access directly. CPU can access directly the main memory and all, can, can do that. And the main memory usually will do a random access. It means that random access means, suppose the main memory size equals to, for example, you have about uh, 12 GB, for example. So it means that uh, 12 GP means there are about uh, uh, like in principle like a 12 G, 12 into 10 power 9 locations, memory locations where each location holds a byte. So it means that in the random access means so here for uh, for accessing any of the location, like in principle it takes uh, the, the the time to access any memory location will be same, will be same. It's not a sequential access. It's not a sequential access. Suppose if you take some other medium, suppose when you take a tape, for example, magnetic tape, tape or some other thing, where the access is a sequential one. That means here you need to access the tape like sequentially so that uh, you reach to the particular point where the file is available. But uh, whereas here in case of main memory where the access is a random access, it means that so if you give a memory address, whether it may be at the lowermost address or the higher address or wherever, it almost takes the, the same amount of time to reach to the to access that particular uh, memory location. That's what I mean by the random access. And it's a volatile. It means that uh, the contents of the memory are not uh, 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 will will be off or will be loosed last uh, when you uh, when you remove the power or when there is no power at all. So it's what I mean by the volatile and all. That means the main main memory, the contents will be lost when you switch off. And again, when you switched on, again, it has to load from the uh, like non volatile memory, whatever is there behind that. So the, this is the characteristics. And the secondary storage, it means basically hard disk in our uh, perception, like extension to the main memory that uh, provides a larger non, uh, non volatile storage capacity. So the hard disk where the contents are uh, like uh, permanent, Contents are permanent. Even though if you switch off, also the contents uh, that will be there in the hard disk, they 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 uh, they don't arise at all. They will be there. So that's why this is a non-volatile memory. And as you, all of us are familiar, that uh, the hard disk, the size of the secondary storage is much larger compared to the the main memory and all. And uh, then coming to the hard disk, the magnetic disk. Ah, 
Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I have a, now. Uh-huh. Let's send it to her. Okay. 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 Yeah, I'm going to do both. I'm class. I'm going to talk about it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, oh yeah. Right. Coming to the Mangri disks, uh, yeah, that's nothing but uh, the hard disks, whatever uh, we know that. And uh, you know that in the hard disk, the way the, the, the characteristics of the hard disk will be like, uh, it's like uh, magnetic recording material will be coated and uh, there the data will be organized, uh, will be in the form of uh, uh, like the self in the form of tracks and sectors. So on that, the data will be like stored in the, in the form of a blocks of data, right? And uh, the device controller will uh, takes care of that device controller that the disk controller, whatever is there that determines the uh, like logical interaction between the, the device and the computer. So uh, actually, if you, if you look at here, uh, this one. So therefore, if you see the disk and all the nature of the disk uh, will be different for storing the, the information and all. And if you see the some other device, for example, uh, you can have uh, semiconductor devices where the nature of storage, the main memory, for example, where the nature of storage, the way the, the information will be stored, that will be different. And for example, you have a mouse, for example, the way the information that is uh, you can uh, pick up from the mouse uh, where the, the nature is different and likewise keyboard. So that way all these devices, they have their different characteristics for acquiring the data. So therefore, you need to have specific device controller which hides the the physical properties, the physical characteristics of the device and all. So that way, for a computer, all these device controller will give you a uniform interface where they can able to access directly to the all these devices and all. So that's the purpose of the device controller and all. And uh, as you see that, as I mentioned, that the storage will be in the hierarchical way. We have already seen that the cache versus main memory and all. And uh, this uh, hierarchy depends upon these properties like a speed, cost, and uh, volatility. Um, like uh, cost means the this one, the normal, the price, and uh, speed is the access time, and volatility means uh, the permanency of the contents and all. So these things will vary. Uh, like uh, as you go to the upper side, uh, like uh, towards uh, if you want to have a very high speed uh, memory and all, where the cost will be more and the volatility will not be there. Uh, and then if you come down at a bottom level where the speed will be less and it has it offers a very large storage uh, and uh, it offers a non volatility it means that the contents whatever is there so that will be stable and uh, it will be permanent and the cost is also a bit uh, reasonable so that way these three factors varies with respect to the hierarchy we'll see that and caching we have already mentioned the, the purpose of caching and copying the information into faster storage system for example, a main memory can be viewed as a cache to the secondary storage, obvious, right? The main memory can be viewed as a cache to the secondary storage because you see the secondary storage, the, the volume of, or you can say that the size of the secondary storage will be in the form of terabytes, whereas the main memory, the its uh, order is in terms of like gigabytes and all. And uh, with respect to speeds also, like uh, for a disk axis and all, you have the, the speed will be in terms of milliseconds, for example. Whereas if you want to access the main memory, the speed will be in the terms of like uh, tens or hundreds of nanoseconds. Mm -hmm. So that way you can use the hierarchy. Uh, you can see here. So this is the hierarchy of uh, the storage where it starts from the magnetic tapes to at the bottom side to the registers. That is registers are nothing but uh, these are the like um, the storage elements that are within the CPU, right? Within the CPU. And uh, so here from this hierarchy, you can come to know that the registers are very fast. That means CPU can able to access the registers at highest speed at uh, very fast with very low access time and all. Then the cache, then the main memory, then the other things like electronic disk, magnetic disk and so on. So this is the way the memory hierarchy will be there. And then if you look at that, actually the properties, whatever I just mentioned, the speed, cost, access time, and uh, the like volatility and other things and all. So they follow based on this hierarchy and all. Right. Uh, yeah, as we have already mentioned that the caching and all, it's like, uh, yeah, this is just very intuitive. Like you can use the caching at different levels and all, as I mentioned, 
like you can say that uh, the cache that is there within the processor and the main memory. So with respect to main memory, that becomes a cache and the main memory happens to be cache for the secondary memory. Uh, likewise, you can have at different levels uh, uh, the, the, the storage device, the storage uh, system that is uh, preceding to that happens to be cached to the, uh, the system and all. So that way you can view that and the information that is copied from a slower to the, the faster storage temporarily. And then the faster storage, yeah, uh, the yeah, the basic principle is that uh, if you want to access the data, the CPU will first check the the fastest uh, uh, device, uh, the, uh, the 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 place storage place, and then afterwards, if it is not there, then it will go to the next hierarchy, and uh, that way, uh, uh, yeah, uh, that is the way it, uh, the data uh, access will be done. And then, uh, yeah, since the cache is a smaller one, then it has certain issues and all. Like, uh, there will be trade-off between the size of the cache and uh, the information that to be stored and all. Like, so that way, the size of the cache, and then since the cache is a limited size, um, um, and uh, to feed the information from the main memory to the cache, or like the preceding storage to the cache and all, so there will be certain policies will be there, like what contents to be placed and which to be removed, for example. So all these things are there. It has its own uh, policies and all, right? So this is about the caching. So it's a very generic one, the, the principle of caching. And, all. and you will study these things more detailed way in the computer architecture and all. So where you study that actually what uh, the cache, how the cache is organized and how the uh, the cache replacement policy. That means the information content actually, how the which data to be placed, which has to be removed. So all these things will be done by the most. It is done by the hardware actually. Hmm. So because uh, the access time should be faster. Hmm. So th that way you can uh, see the more details in your architecture part. Right. Okay. So yeah. Now let's take a break for five minutes. Okay. And after that we'll continue the. Uh, the lecture and all. So please take a break and uh, we'll continue. And uh, again, I will stop at 11.40. Then you can start the quiz at 11.45. Mm? Okay, so let's take a break and then we'll come back. Yeah, let me stop the recording now and then again I will start later. Mm-hmm. 